Hi, and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 2. When we last met, we started talking about the fundamental ideas behind quantum mechanics, and we said there are five basic postulates that underlie most of the important concepts. In the last video, we talked about the first postulate. Any system made of matter is completely described by a wave equation called a wave function. And we talked about the conditions that a wave function must have in order to be a realistic description of a system. The most important implication of that postulate is that we can make predictions about the properties and behaviors of a system with great accuracy as long as we know what the wave function is. But how exactly do we do that? How do we take the wave function and use it to determine properties like the position, the momentum, or the energy of a system? That's what we'll talk about for the next couple of videos. It might surprise you just how much information you can get from a wave function. But before we can talk about the second postulate of quantum mechanics, we have to talk about a little bit more basic mathematics. In fact, it's something so basic that you might never have given it much thought. To start out, think about the following three very simple functions. 4 times x, 4 times pi, and 32 times theta. Notice that all three of these involve multiplying something by 4. Even the last one can be thought of that way, because we could look at it as multiplying 8 theta by 4. We can write all three of these in a different way. Suppose we use this symbol to indicate the act of multiplying whatever comes after it by 4. This is known as an operator. You can always tell that a particular symbol is an operator because of this mark above it, which is sometimes called a hat. In this case, we could use that symbol to write the three functions above in this way. Now, suppose we write this function. In this case, the parentheses tell us that the operator a hat is operating on the entire function that follows it. So the result of this operation would be 16x cubed plus 8e to the 5x minus 4 cosine 2x. Let's try another example, this time with a different operator. Suppose this time the operator a hat is this. This tells us to take the second derivative with respect to x of whatever follows the operator. So, for example, if we apply this operator to the function 8 times x, the result is 0, because the second derivative of 8x is 0. Now let's try it on this function, which we saw a little while ago. This one is much trickier. You'll need to draw on your knowledge of calculus in order to solve it, so hopefully you've taken a semester of calculus before you started PCHEM. Taking the second derivative here is a little bit hard to do in one step, so let's break it into two steps. First, we'll take the first derivative. That gives us 12x squared for the first term, 10e to the 5x power for the next term, and positive 2 sine of 2x for the last term. So that's the first derivative. Now we'll find the second derivative. That gives us 24x for the first term, 50e to the 5x for the middle term, and 4 times the cosine of 2x for the last term. So, that's all an operator is. It's a symbol representing a mathematical operation that we can perform on a number or a function. So, why do we need to know about them? Well, they're crucial for the next two postulates we'll need in quantum mechanics. The second postulate tells us to think about what happens when we make a measurement on a system. It doesn't matter what exactly we're measuring. Perhaps we measure its location or its energy, or perhaps its magnetic moment. As you know, the system is described by a wave function, and as we discussed in the last video, the wave function can be written as a wave equation. The second postulate tells us that every measurement we could possibly make on a system corresponds to causing a mathematical operator to operate on the wave function. So, there's a different operator for every possible property that we could measure for our system. That's what postulate 2 of quantum mechanics tells us. Every measurable property of a system can be represented by a different mathematical operator. 
So, what do these operators look like? Let's look at a few of them. Suppose the property we're measuring is the location of the system in the x dimension. In that case, the operator has the symbol x hat, and the operator is just multiplication by x. Think about what that's telling us. When we measure the location of a system on the x-axis, that measurement corresponds to taking the wave function of the system and multiplying it by x. Let's find out what a few more operators look like. Suppose we measure the momentum of our system along the x-axis. The operator representing that measurement has the symbol px hat, and the operator is negative i times h bar times the first derivative with respect to x. You might recall that the symbol h bar is equal to Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So, when we measure the momentum of our system, that corresponds to taking the first derivative of the wave function and multiplying the result by negative i h bar. Here are a few more operators. The operator for momentum in three dimensions is similar to the one for one dimension. This time, it's negative i h bar times the first derivative in each of the three dimensions added together. Notice that we also have a unit vector before each of the three derivatives. That's because momentum has a direction, which makes it a vector quantity. The operator for the kinetic energy along the x dimension is this. And here's the kinetic energy in three dimensions. Like the operators we saw for the momentum, the kinetic energy operator in three dimensions is very similar to the one for one dimension. But there are three terms one for each of the dimensions. This last operator is worth a bit more discussion. The term in parentheses occurs in many different situations in physics and physical chemistry, so it actually gets its own symbol. The sum of the second derivatives for each of the three dimensions is symbolized this way. The triangle looks like an upside-down Greek letter delta, and it's often called del. So we can rewrite the operator this way negative h bar squared over 2m times del squared. The last operator we need to know about is the operator for the total energy of our system. That operator has the symbol h hat. As you probably know, the total energy is just equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So that looks like this, where the potential energy has the symbol v and is a function of the variables x, y, and z. We'll be using this operator quite a bit in future videos, so you'll want to try to remember it as soon as you can. The reason why the operator has the symbol h hat is because it's called the Hamiltonian, after the Irish mathematician William Hamilton, who discovered the connections between the mathematics of momentum and position. Along with Robert Boyle, he's one of Ireland's most influential scientists, and he was even honored by a commemorative euro coin that has his name and the Dell symbol on it. Anyway, let's get back to the connection between operators and quantum mechanics. It turns out that whenever we perform an experiment to measure a property of a system, we're essentially performing this calculation. In this equation, a hat is the operator for the property we're measuring, psi is the wave function of the system, and little a is the result of our measurement. So, for example, if we were measuring the momentum of our system, then a hat would be the operator for momentum, and little a would actually be the result of the experiment, the numerical value of the momentum. An equation like this one, in which an operator working on a function gives as its result a constant multiplied by the original function, is called an eigenvalue equation. The function, which appears on both sides of the equation, is called an eigenfunction. And the constant on the right side is called the eigenvalue. Let's look at an example that will show you how eigenvalue equations work. Suppose we have this operator, which takes the second derivative of whatever comes after it. We use this operator on a function called zeta, which is this Greek letter. The function zeta is equal to the sine of 3x 
plus e to the power 3ix. Let's see what we get. The second derivative is a little tricky, so I'll do it in two steps. First, we'll take the first derivative. That gives us 3 cosine of 3x for the first term, and 3i e to the 3ix for the second term. So now let's take the second derivative. That gives us negative 9 sine 3x for the first term, and 9 times i squared e to the 3ix for the second term. Now you might remember from the previous video that i squared is equal to negative 1. So that finally gives us this as a result of the calculation. Now compare this result to the function that we started with. Our answer is just equal to negative 9 times the original function. So we can rewrite the equation this way. Writing it this way makes it easy to see that this is an eigenvalue equation. In this case, the eigenfunction is our function zeta, and the eigenvalue is equal to negative 9. And that brings us to our next postulate, postulate number 3. This postulate tells us that when we make a measurement of a system, that measurement can always be described by an eigenvalue equation, where the result of the measurement is the eigenvalue. In other words, the measurement can be represented by this equation. So, as you can see, the wave function is an eigenfunction, and little a is the eigenvalue, which is the result of our measurement. Notice that there are subscripts on both psi and a. That's because it's possible for our system to have many different eigenfunctions, and each of them will result in a different outcome in our measurement. For example, suppose we decided to measure the energy of a hydrogen atom. We could write the corresponding eigenvalue equation this way. Remember, measuring the energy of the system corresponds to using the Hamiltonian operator on the wave function. But the energy of the system is different depending on what orbital the electron is located in. Each of the possible orbitals will have a different wave function, and that's why each of them will give us a different result when we measure the energy. But there's one difficulty with this eigenvalue equation. Whenever we perform a measurement on a system, the result of our measurement always must be a real number. It's impossible to measure the energy or position of a system and discover that it's an imaginary number. However, it is possible that either the wave function or the operator or both might have i in them. In fact, you've already seen this. Remember, we saw earlier that the operator for momentum in one dimension is this, which has an imaginary number in it but we know that the result of a measurement must always be a real number with no i in it, so the eigenvalue has to be real. How can we be sure that an equation like this will always give us a real number as an eigenvalue? Believe it or not, the answer to that question was discovered by the French mathematician Charles Hermite all the way back in 1855, about 65 years before quantum mechanics was developed. Hermite realized that an eigenvalue equation will always have a real number as an eigenvalue if the operator obeys this equation. In this equation, psi and phi are two eigenfunctions of our system. Remember, as I said a minute ago, a system can have several different wave functions. For example, a hydrogen atom will have a different wave function depending on the orbital the electron is in. So, in this equation, psi and phi are two wave functions of the system. We could choose these to be two different wave functions, or the equation should still be true if we decide to choose the same wave function for both psi and phi. So, in the left integral, we have the operator acting on the wave function phi, and the result gets multiplied by the complex conjugate of the wave function psi. In the right-hand integral, the operator acts on psi, and we take the complex conjugate of the result, and then multiply it by phi. We then evaluate both integrals between negative and positive infinity. If we get the same result on both sides of the equation, that means that this operator will always give us a real number for the eigenvalue in an eigenvalue equation. If an operator obeys this equation, we call it a Hermitian operator, after Charles Hermite. 
So, because we must always get a real number when we measure a property of a system, that means that the operator that corresponds to the measurement must be a Hermitian operator, because those always give us real numbers. That seems like a pretty complicated idea, but it's not as bad as it sounds at first. Let's use this equation to show that the momentum operator, which we learned about earlier, is a Hermitian operator. We'll plug that operator into the equation. You might recall that the momentum operator is negative i h bar times the derivative with respect to x. For psi, let's use an actual wave function. Here's the wave function of an actual system. We'll talk about where this came from in a future video, but for now I hope you'll just accept that this is a valid wave function for a system. So I'll plug that into our equation for psi. Finally, I said that psi and phi can be two different wave functions, or they can be the same wave function. To make things a little simpler, let's imagine that psi and phi are the same wave function. So that means I can use the same wave function I use for psi for phi too. One last simplification we can make is that the system this wave function describes doesn't actually stretch all the way from negative to positive infinity. Instead, the system only reaches from zero to a finite distance we'll call a. So those are the limits of our integral. So now we have two integrals to solve. They might look difficult right now, but we'll see in a moment that they're easier than they look. Let's tackle the integral on the left side first. The first thing we need to do is simplify the integral by taking all the constants out. So we can take both factors of the square root of 2 over a out, and also the negative i h bar. That gives us this. Next, we need to take the complex conjugate of the first term. You might recall that to take the complex conjugate, we just change the sign on any imaginary numbers. However, there are no imaginary numbers in the parentheses, so taking the complex conjugate doesn't change anything. Now let's take the derivative of the term in these parentheses. When we do that, we get pi over a times the cosine of pi over a x. Since they're constants, we can move this factor of pi over a out of the integral too, which gives us this. And now we must solve the integral. Fortunately, this integral has a known solution. If you still have your calculus textbook, you might find it in the integral table that's probably at the back of the book. If you find it, you'll see that the integral has this solution. In this case, the constant k corresponds to our factor of pi over a. So that means that we have sine squared of pi x over a divided by 2 pi over a. Let's apply our upper and lower limits to the result and see what we get. The upper limit is a and the lower limit is 0, so we'll plug those in. Now look at the first term. The sine of pi is 0. So that means that the numerator is just equal to 0, and therefore the whole fraction is 0. Meanwhile, in the second term, the sine of 0 is also equal to 0. So the second fraction is 0 overall, too. That means this entire part of our equation is 0. So we're halfway there. We're trying to find out if the momentum operator is Hermitian, and we said that in order for that to be true, the two sides of this equation have to be equal. We just found out that the left side is 0. Let's see what we get on the right side. Once again, we'll plug in our momentum operator, and we'll use our wave function for psi and phi. Notice, this time, the term involving the complex conjugate does have an imaginary number in it. So let's change the sign on the i before we move on. Now that we've done that, we can pull the constants out of the integral as we did before. Now we'll take the derivative of this term, which gives us pi over a times the cosine of pi over a x. We can move the constants out of the integral, which leaves us with this. 
you might remember that the integral we're left with is exactly the same as the integral we had to solve for the left side of the equation. And we saw that that integral is equal to zero. So that means the right side of our equation is zero. And that's also what we got on the left side. So that means the two sides of our equation are equal to each other, which is what we expect for a Hermitian operator. Well, we've done some pretty intense math for one day, so let's stop there. You'll get plenty of practice during class using what we've just learned. You'll work with eigenvalue equations and learn to identify Hermitian operators. To sum up where we are so far, we've now covered three of the five postulates of quantum mechanics. First, a system can be described by a wave function, and the wave function contains all the information that can be known about the system. Second, every measurable property of a system can be represented by an operator. And third, taking a measurement of a property in a real system corresponds to causing the operator for that property to act on the wave function of the system. The result of that measurement will always be an eigenvalue of the equation involving the operator and the wave function. We've got two postulates left, and we'll talk about those in the next video. Once we know them, we'll be able to start looking at some real systems, and we'll find out how to apply what we've learned to actual atoms and molecules. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.